I'd attack the idea of John. You can attack John. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I've seen worse, whatever it is. You cannot attack John without permission, which you now have. <laughs> okay. So, um, in person people, please make sure you uh, log into the on site tool. We will be managing the mic queue with the online tool. Remote participants, uh, please keep your audio and video off unless you are speaking. So uh, we have, go ahead. go ahead. We have a uh, new RFC, RFC okay. 9410. I did want to say thank you for to Simon for taking notes for us, and thank you to Sean for watching the chat room. Thank you. Um, we have a service provider OOB, which is uh, in the Shepherd write-up process, and there we have a discussion point on that. It was originally processed as informational, but there are some people who are requesting standards track. Does, Anyone object to that? And if so, please come to the mic and say why. Um, and whether you think we need to make a separate last call to make that change. Uh, I already actually did make a call, a consensus call on the uh, list about two weeks ago. So um, Which I is, would consider it done unless someone objects, you know, by whenever I get around to finishing the shepherd write up, which will be sometime next week. Okay, I, it was not a full last call. It was kind of, this is what I'm intending, right? Okay. All right. Okay. That's why I'm if asking. Someone thinks we need another last call. That's what I'm asking. And I'm not hearing anyone ask for that. Okay, so consider it with proceeding on the standards track. And if you have concerns about that, please speak on the list as is fine too. Okay, um, I think we're done with the administrivia part of the agenda at that point, uh, or at this point. We have um, three documents we plan to discuss today, uh, connected identity, uh, certificate lifetimes, and STIR with MLS. Does anyone want to bash the agenda? All right, I think we'll start with connected identity. I guess our AD decided to sleep in. You know, I decided to sleep in today too. I am here perhaps in body, but my <laughs> mind has long since checked out. Do you mind if I just have a little yeah, set my water no down there? Worries. Thank you. So I'm John and uh, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of things that we have talked about here before and then actually one new thing, which is pretty cool. Have something fresh on the agenda. So next slide, please. It's not July. Oh yeah, the slides, this, this is, I always just take my previous slides and like, <laughs> so I believe that it actually is 40, RC 4916, not 4196 that we are updating here, but uh, next slide, please. And it's November. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is, you know, look, this is a best effort thing is updating the title slide. I do try to at least pay attention to the content of the things that are gonna follow. Um, so what is this draft? Why are we doing this? This is a spiel I've given many times since we have discussed this document here many times, but way back in you know, a dinosaur, era when dinosaurs roamed the earth, a fellow by the name of John Elwell uh, produced a specification called RFC 4916. And this was based on our original identity header, uh, RFC 4474, which did not make such a big splash in the world back when we released it, but it first kind of specified the idea you could sign a subset of a SIP request and people relying parties could use that to ascertain the authenticity of the sender. But John looked at a different problem, which was connected identity, which was the issue of, okay, once we've established who the instigating party is for a SIP session, how do we ascertain who was actually reached? And uh, he developed a fairly complex process for doing this, which was predicated on the use of things like prax and um, you know, doing various things with mid-dialogue requests to clarify 
who the endpoints were in them. And this is related to like some legacy stuff that even predates RFC 3261 that goes back to the original SIP RFC um, that had uh, dialog matching constraints that required the to and from to always be identical before things were gonna work. And like we'd long since hope we didn't have to worry about that anymore. But anyway, 4916 addressed that. And we went out to say, okay, great. That was written for 4474. What would we do now in the world of RFC 8224 and the modern STIR specifications? And what we ultimately decided after I did some initial um, very ill-considered efforts to map John's original mechanism onto processing was offers a greatly simpler approach. And this greatly simpler approach, we simply defined a new passport type, which is called RSP for response. These passports can only appear in responses. And um, you know, their, their use is not necessarily limited to SIP if we wanted to talk about out-of-band um, transactions as well that leverage stir, it works for that too. But uh, really it's covered here with SIP as the focus. And you can think of it like if you're familiar with the div mechanism we created for call forwarding for diversion, where if you send uh, you know, invite with a passport to an entity that is going to forward the call, the type of passport that entity generates actually um, signs the dest field rather than the orig field of the passport because what you really want in this diversion case is to know that it was the entity that has you know, received this, that is responsible for the original target number that is saying, it's okay to forward this on to someone else. So similarly, RSP is signed via the test. That's the high level thing. Next slide. Lost my cursor. Yeah, so there's a new 04 version. Now we did already have a working group last call, but after working group last call, and I believe it was about 15 minutes before our previous uh, STIR meeting in San Francisco, Jonathan Rosenberg sent a number of comments about this. And uh, I think they were all useful interventions. And so I made a couple of updates to reflect that. Um, one is that I added the two-factor authentication use case explicitly to the motivation. Since one of the things that's really interesting about connected identity, if you think about how this might be leveraged in practice, are cases where you're either using a call or a message. If you're like an enterprise, a bank, something like that, and you want to validate that, in fact, you are, you know, the, the entity with the telephone number of record is the person you're communicating with over the web, wouldn't it be great if you actually got some assurance, a stir-like assurance from whoever it is you, you're reaching out to, that the number you're calling is, in fact, the number that's responding? Uh, so we put that in. Uh, Jonathan had a couple of comments about places where we made normative statements that were kind of in the middle of a paragraph and were assuming you'd read the rest of the paragraph, but if you just took that sentence in isolation, they could probably be read a bit too broadly. So uh, we, we carved those things up and hope, hopefully fixed them. You know, there is no uh, capability negotiation that we defined in connected identity. We don't leverage the traditional SIP mechanisms like required and supported and things like that to ascertain do both parties on the ends of the session actually support this connected identity mechanism or not. So previously I had some language in there that was like, look, if you get response identity, connected identity, you know, you should always then sign further mid dialogue or dialogue terminating requests and responses as the session continues. Uh, Jonathan felt that was a little too strong and ultimately I think I agree. So we dropped that to a should. And um, you know, I still think that because there are a lot of interesting fraud use cases, especially in the international mobile space, these are things like IRSF, if you're familiar with these kinds of threats, um, where having you know, just the ability to know that the buy that the, the session terminating message in SIP came from the right entity and not from some middleman who is trying to make it appear like the call is a little bit longer than it is to one of the sides of this because there's some like total arbitrage thing they can exploit for that. Um, you know, because of that, I think it still really is valuable to if we, if we want to apply stir to those kinds of fraud cases. Um, but like, I'm not going to insist on it. So sure, uh, should seem okay. And finally, we clarified this is not supposed to work for cancel. And you know, cancel is the request in SIP that you send after you've sent an invite to say, like, actually, let's just tear this session down. Obviously, if you think about it just the way I described it, well, isn't this a vector for DDoS? Couldn't people you know, be uh, synthesizing cancel messages to tear down requests and without stir? Oh my god, we have this like, huge gap in the security of this. 
Um, the problem is cancels get issued for all kinds of reasons by like intermediaries who are doing parallel or sequential forking in SIP that are not necessarily the entities that actually would be able to sign a cancel. And so ultimately relying parties can only get like so much out of having that be signed. That said, I mean, we're not going to explicitly forbid sending cancel for the reason that um, it could be, in fact, the original UAC that is sending a cancel, in which case you will get that strong assurance. We just don't want people to expect that you're necessarily going to receive it. And then if you don't see it, that's like a big problem. So that's what I did in 04. Next slide. Oh, any, any questions about any of that? Anybody think that's misguided? We should have done something different. I know this is very, very exciting stuff. And it's, uh, you know, for Friday morning, it's uh, might be a little. So, so anyway, I think we should dance if, every, if everyone is cool with uh, the new fixes. Was anybody not cool? You got a Robert not cool? No, Robert's cool, but I'm curious. Please. I'll remind people who aren't here. Yeah, I, I actually don't think I entered I myself into the. <laughs> I should probably. Right. I should probably sign the blue sheet, should I? So, yeah, Robert Robert Sparks chair hat on. Um, if you read this draft, please raise your hand. This version. I don't oh. care any version. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you've implemented this draft, please raise your hand. One. <laughs> so um, we can reconfirm this on the list, but I think what we're recording is no objection and not enthusiasm. Uh, so it's not exactly implementation, but this is on the radar of IPN and I now. Oh yeah, no, I don't. I have no. And just, I and I want and this to proceed. Person, yes. chair, chair hat off. I think this is good. I have read the draft, but the number of people that are paying attention is small. What can we do? It's about the same as most of our drafts, I think. Yeah. It's glamorous work, working on the telephone network and the ITF. Uh, let me tell you, we, we really pack them in here in these meetings. Yeah. So, um, you know, this document is and has been for a very long time in working group last call, <laughs> but we really do want to finish it. Um, at the same time, if you have concerns, please raise them because we're about to make the consensus call. <laughs> So are we trying to make a consensus call about is this ready to uh, public? Yep. Other than, you know, the shepherd stuff? Yes, we got to do the shepherd right up. I guess it's my turn. Are we asking the room that? Yes. Just to add my two cents, um, I, I agree with what John, with uh, what uh, Ben was saying that it, for a while it, people didn't have time to look at it, but now people are starting to talk about it. So, so now is a good time to uh, get, you know, finalize things. Yeah, and we need this for messaging and for SIP Brandy and for like a whole bunch of other things. It has a lot of dependencies. It seems my experience with this particular working group is that unless you last call it, you don't get a lot of eyes on it. So let's get it, let's let's do the last call. We are yes, already no, did. But like, yeah. No, but like move it to the ISG and then yeah. like see what else happens. So oh, get the ITF yeah, last yeah, call. Yeah, get ITF last call. And then people are like, oh, you're really, really serious. Yes, we are really, really serious. Let's get it done. So. Let's do that. Yeah, I'm sure the SEC ADs will subject this to their usual implements of torture comparable to the Spanish Inquisition. Um, OK, we're moving to the next doc. Great, so I can sit down, right? That's a joke. It's all me. I'm, a, I'm, I'm sorry. Next all all this is me, so like. Freshness. Uh, uh, this time you took the date off. <laughs> you know, I should just have my template not include dates. It does say 118. It's accurate. I think that the draft, draft names are actually correct, I think. So that's a, it's a step up from my previous efforts. No um, version of this. No versions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. That makes it easier for me to reuse them if I just don't bother putting versions. <laughs> so what is this about freshness for stir shirt? Uh, stir, stir shirts. Yes. Yeah, stir, <laughs> stir shirts. Um, 
So we all know that uh, a tremendous amount of work has been done, in fact, by some people sitting in this room on uh, PKI and X509 in particular, and questions about how you make sure that a certificate that you are dealing with, that you are relying on, actually uh, has not expired and remains fresh at this moment. And so there's a ton of pre-existing work on this, which we have done our best to cannibalize. Um, but there is just something a little bit different about the way that STIR leverages X509, and that is the presence of this extension, uh, the TN authorization list. And the TN authorization list, it's a bucket of um, potentially what we call service provider codes in North America. That would be uh, operating company numbers, OCNs or SPIDs, could be other things in other jurisdictions. I've seen some interesting one-off uses of SPCs as well in the wild that I don't approve of. But you know, this, this is one way of populating the TN off list. The other is to have a list of TNs for which you were authorized, literally have a list of literal telephone numbers that you enumerate. And it could be ranges, it could be individual numbers um, that are actually baked into the cert itself. So any relying party looking at the cert is gonna be able to say either, okay, this was the carrier, the operating company number or whatever that is vouching for this passport if it's signed with that cert. Or here is a list of telephone numbers that this cert is supposed to be able to sign for. And if the originating number in the passport does not correspond with that, you might really want to think about relying on that. That might not be an excellent idea. Um, but therein lies the rub. See, if you bake into a cert a list of telephone numbers, the problem is telephone number ownership is kind of dynamic. There are all kinds of factors that can lead to telephone numbers entering and leaving the inventory of a party that could potentially be a signature for STIR. And number portability is one, just mergers and acquisitions. So just ordinary business, hey, we're shutting down that call center and we're not using those numbers anymore. So we've been looking for some time and a couple of approaches to this. Uh, the favored ones seem to be doing OCSP, the Online Certificate Status Protocol, um, and short-lived certs. But there's a lot of subvariants. Next slide. So Jack, uh, geez, it's probably like a year ago now, maybe more, uh, sent a nice list to the mail in which he enumerated what he saw as the options in play around this. Now, in the baseline RFC 8226 specification, which is where we defined the TN off list uh, extension to X509, uh, we already talked about using the AIA extension in order to be able to uh, point to by reference rather than baked into the cert, like through a URL, what the TN off list is that the cert is valid for. And that's an attractive option because then really you can update that list on the other end of that URL, like as much as you want. And you know, if you need things to move in or out, uh, that's great. What's the problem with it? Well, the main problem is you're then revealing through that URL that is in a public certificate that anybody can access what all of the numbering resources are that you possess, right? And there are some carriers who expressed a couple of reservations about this. Uh, they weren't sure for competitive reasons. They really wanted to have to divulge the entire set of telephone numbers potentially that they, they have uh, to the world in public search, which means just anybody can get them. So then we started talking about OCSP. And Sean Turner and I, uh, and I should say Sean did most of the work on here because he actually understands OCSP far better than I do, looked at a potential extension that we could build to the online uh, certificate status protocol. And this is something that's fairly widely, sorry, is there a, you done? Keep so, going. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> Ignore us. Okay, um, so, something that's fairly widely used in, um, did I advance on that? Yeah, you did advance. Oh, okay. I'm not quite done yet. I'm going to go right, through these. Uh, we got plenty of time, is my understanding. So we've got three, three drafts to talk about here. So, um, you know, OCSP basically allows you in real time to check that uh, the certificate remains valid at the time a relying party is going to use it. This has been widely used in some implementations of web PKI in web browsers. There are alternative approaches now, perhaps that have more traction, like simply pushing uh, certificate revocation list down to the browser itself on some schedule. You see that in browsers like Chrome, um, but it's still widely implemented. There's a lot of libraries for it, no reason not to use it. So we extended that to be able to pose a, a different question than OCSP usually does, which is, this certificate, is it still valid for the following telephone number? 
and you just get back a binary yes or no answer. So you're no longer having to download, well, if this certificate covers a million telephone numbers, you're not going to download a list of that. What you're going to do is push this OCSP query and get back from the OCSP server um, a response that says, thumbs up. You asked if like this number is in the scope of the cert, it is or it isn't. And that seemed like an approach that had much better privacy properties and everything else, so we specified that. Issue is, of course, that means that your stir verification service on the terminating side, which is the relying party, that um, has to then do an RTT to go like make a query up to this, get this back. That could lead to post dial delay or just delay in processing the call. It kind of seemed like a hassle. And it also, unfortunately, also reveals to the OCSP service something about a call in progress, right? So from a data minimization perspective, you're actually taking the hit of knowing in that instance, this particular terminating provider received a call for this telephone number at this time. And that's a little bit sensitive. So um, instead, we started looking at a stapling approach. We had previously broken this out into a separate draft. And I guess I should explain that. What is stapling? So stapling was something that was also developed for the web PKI to solve more or less the same problem. In uh, stapling, instead of the browser, effectively having to go out and query this OSPSP service to determine, is this the right certificate for Amazon.com? Is this not expired and everything else? Instead, Amazon kind of pre-pushes down in your you know, initial setup, your TLS and HTTP connections you're making to Amazon's web service, actually like pushes down with that. Here's a staple that is what you would have gotten if you queried OCSP. So that like, you know now that this is legit and you don't have to like bother coming and asking some service about it. So it speeds things up. And um, for that reason, we thought it would be attractive to do that uh, with STIR as well. So we defined a new um, uh, STIR claim for that that appears in Passports, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So that's one broad approach. Do this with OCSP with stapling or no. The second broad approach is to do this with short-lived certificates. And short-lived certificates have the virtue of um, being able to be customized down even to the level of an individual telephone number. So that you, know, you could even imagine on a per call basis, a STIR authentication service that's going to sign a passport you know, could you know, synthesize a cert that is just for the telephone number that is in the ridge field of the passport and all the relying party gets then when they receive this, this passport is a cert that vouches, yes, for the moment, for whatever brief interval, um, this is a legit cert to be signing for that particular telephone number. And that comes with its own operational complexities. If you have a lot of telephone numbers, you're going to be generating and synthesizing a lot of certs. It also unfortunately suffers from the same RTT problem on the verification service side in that the X5 view parameter of um, Passport, which we borrowed from JOTS, from JWT, um, it requires an HTTP dip that would be performed by the terminating side, by the verification service to go fetch this short-lived certificate. And unfortunately, these don't have good cacheability properties. Ordinary stir shaken operations, you get, um, you, if these certs are very long lived, a service provider cert could be valid for years. Um, that wouldn't be the case for these. These would only be valid for, for a very small amount of time, so you can't cache them, so you got to fetch them a lot. All right, so what can we do about that? Well, it turns out there is some protocol stuff we can rely on for that, which I've now built into short lived. So that's the options in play. And next slide. This is what we like boiled this down to now. And I guess I probably did basically speak to all that already. So ne ne next slide. <laughs> While I was doing the options, I basically did the voiceover for that slide already. Um, so what we've done, as I said, in the OCSP draft, we have um, now incorporated this uh, staple element of passports into the draft itself. Its job is to carry within the passport what the OCSP response would be if you asked for that particular, uh, with this extension that John and I developed, if you asked, is this certificate still valid for this particular telephone number? We're just going to like bake that into the passport. And you get it at the time you get the passport, and you have no need to contact OCSP for it. That seems pretty cool. 
Um, and so we've just decided to make that part of the baseline draft. And for short-lived, our proposal is to carry a certificate chain via the X5C parameter, which is defined in JWS and RFC 7515. And that serves basically the same purpose as a staple. Instead of using X5U, where the, you know, the relying party on the short-lived cert has to go fetch the cert, we're just going to push the cert itself in the passport and the entire chain of everything you need to validate that cert. Because of course, this could be, you need to have the, the, the root um, you know, CA's public cert, and then you need to have whatever the service provider cert is, and potentially even a delegate cert. So this could be a substantial chain, and it can indeed go further. You could have sub-delegations and things like that. But you just take all that, you put it in, and you just push it in the passport. But bear in mind, it's a big staple. Um, next slide. A big staple. Yeah, so I actually, um, we have new versions of both of these specs. I will say the 05 version of short-lived was just submitted like yesterday afternoon. And I put it in just so we would have an example of what that X5C field would look like. I happen to borrow the one that is in the Appendix C, I think, of uh, RFC 7515 um, to make sure. And you can go look at it right now on the web. And you know, I, I will say this, it goes over pages of the, the, R, uh, the, the internet draft, right? Like if you're going to have three certs that you're pushing in this, it's going to be big, um, much bigger than a staple, especially now that, that, that I think that example in 7515 is not an EC DSA cert example. I think it's, you know, so we, we may get some byte savings if we actually like mock up what this would look like, but the byte savings are not going to be terribly substantial. Um, we also do need to fix the example of stapled OCSP in the new 06 version of that draft. I have asked my co-author, Mr. Turner, to please do that because I spent so much trying, trying to get OpenSSL to incorporate a proprietary extension it was not familiar with into <laughs> a certificate that I could use for this purpose for OCSP, and I gave up. Um, see, there's just a lot of like config files where you're supposed to be able to like put this stuff in and like my, my OpenSSL foo is insufficient for me to be able to actually accomplish that. Um, but yeah, so th there's two new versions of these things. And I think we're getting there on the, uh, the 06 OCSP. If we just get that example fixed, that should be good. But next slide. Oh, wait, no, no, stay here, sorry. But there is one thing about short-lived I wanted to actually point to, and this is something Chris and I were just talking about over lunch on Wednesday. Um, we do have some normative language in that draft now about support for X5C, because no stir shaken implementation in the world today supports this, right? Everybody uses X5U. Um, people will be shocked and clutch pearls when they hear that they need to support something in a passport header other than X5U. So what we have in the language there, um, you know, be in the be, be strict in what you send and generous in what you receive philosophy is, um, a must for support for compliant implementations that if you're, if you are compliant with this short lived spec, okay. there is a must. <laughs> yes, there is a must for you to support receiving X5C and a should for sending it for ASs when certs are shorter lived than one week. So this doesn't update our core documents. This does right? not update our core documents. Okay. This is if you are supporting this short lived extension, like, you know, that, that that is the normative requirement that we are imposing upon you. I kind of picked shorter lived than a week out of a hat. Could be a day, could be, does anyone have any opinion about that? Like how long short lived should be for the purpose where we really want to say, you should use this X5C thing if your certificate falls below this threshold of expiry. I, uh, I think a week is a pretty good start. I mean, maybe less, I think, would be typically used. But um, but I think I also wanted to note that this is really intended not for just SPC level certs, but for, for delegate certs. Delegate certs. Yeah. So um, I don't think having these new requirements is a, is a bad thing. Plus, if you used any fairly standard JWT implementation, it probably isn't a big step to support X5C either. So. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Like anything that actually supports like core JWS should support this. I wonder how many authentication service and verification service libraries actually, you know, relied on like a JWS stack as opposed to just wrote a custom thing that parses exactly the JSON. And yeah. like, that is, I think, been my experience. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I could ask it the other way. How many actually explicitly turned that off? <laughs> yeah, 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 fair enough. I haven't figured out how to add myself to the queue when I'm chair using the online tool. So I'm, I'm going to jump it. Uh, <laughs> it. It seems like the my intuition is the week is a little long. And yeah. the reason I'm thinking that is I'm thinking this mainly in terms of cache hits. And I guess it doesn't really matter uh, if we we're if we we're stapling. But uh, I I'm, don't think that the operator is going to be too worried about cache hits on a weekly basis. So you, you, you think bringing it down to like a day would be more sensible? That's my intuition, but it's not strong. Yeah, my, mine isn't either, which is why I'm posing the question. I, I sort of like, at least in the document, more than a day, just because time frames of things seem to be a little longer than that in this world. But um, I'm certainly not opposed to the idea of making it shorter, but I just wonder if we should go that far in the document. I think maybe you're right when three I think days. about it. Over the weekend, right? Yeah. Over the weekend? That's actually not bad. Three days. Yeah, three days. My <laughs> I know people, some of the operators that consider a month short-lived. <laughs> uh, is anybody actually Martha's certificate shorter than a few days? So in the web PKI, everyone's very worried about that because we're at the like, clock skew. So I have no idea what, the, what the, this situation is like, but like, there's a like, pretty long tail of like, like I, no one thinks that like less like you know less than a week week is is, is okay. I, I mean I'd say there's virtually no deployment experience of this. This is entirely speculative work at this point. But but I the thing is there it does seem to have some um, traction at least in the chattering class that this is a good direction. And no, no, so no, we're no, just no. trying to get, yeah. No, I guess my just my question is <clears throat> is I think shortlist certs are fine. But I, my question is anybody expect a set shortlist cert lifetime less than a week? Um, yes. Okay. That will definitely need to see experience on, because like I say, um, there's been some measurements of like what browser clock skew is like, it's not great. So I don't think it flew anywhere, but I've heard proposals of synthesizing a new cert per call. Yes. Yeah, there's that and- So they'd be I, valid for a minute. There's that and I do know a company that had 24 hour certs, so. Yeah. Okay. Out in the wild. Yeah, like I said, this is not a domain I know anything about. So, like, it's kind of possible, it's totally cool here. I just wanted to flag it in case people want to. Yeah. I mean, and like <laughs> I said, th th this is should level guidance, right? So, this is, re this is really just yeah. do we want to establish a threshold um, that, that the maximum amount of time, right, where we're not recommending, <laughs> right, that, that, you, uh, that you don't do this? So, um, okay. Well, I mean, you know, I, I kind of like Turner's over the weekend, honestly, as a, and, and if people are going to synthesize on a per call basis, and we, I think we even mentioned in the draft uh, that you could synthesize on a, a per call basis. Um, and I, I do think there is some interest in doing that, actually. You know, we, I don't know what, if we have the infrastructure necessary to actually support that at scale in like any of these implementations, I, I'd be a little reluctant to commit to that for our AS at this point. But like, um, I'm sorry, Chris. No, it's okay. Uh, I I think I want to do plus one for three days just because it's operationally a good amount of time. Yeah. Either weekend or just in general to fix any issues. Well, then, uh, Simon, if you're you're out there, and thank you once again for doing minutes. Uh, let the minutes reflect. We're we're gonna go for three days here. Next slide. So yeah, we just got to fix the example in the OCSP draft. I think then we're, we're I think we're pretty close. I think this is like done. Um, now for the short-lived draft, although this is now my 05 draft Peterson, if we intend to do this, we might want to consider adopting it as a working group item of the STIR working group, if you will think. Does anyone object to a call for adoption at this time? 
seeing no one online and no one in the room, we'll do that. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, John? This, this is not about the adopt or advance thing. Uh, in LAMPS, we did uh, adopt the 5019 uh, BIS draft, which is an update to which the stapling one relies on. And so that the point of that draft, which is about to go on the working group last call, is getting rid of SHA-1 and making it SHA-256. So this, the, the OCSP draft we have here might get shorter because there's less stuff to profile. Okay. So that's nice. that's nice. But I think that shouldn't stop us going forward because it says the same thing. Shockingly, I'm possibly an author on that one too. So that worked out well, but the I'll nice, the nice thing about that particular draft is that we didn't want to write it unless someone was actually going to do it. So Apple and Digist are actually our co-authors oh, nice. on there. So like there's actually hope that it will be easier to be able to get things that sign things and you don't have to like lose hair trying to make it work. So thanks. Can we just have a quick, like, you? sorry, Chris went, um, uh, Discussion about the size of a staple versus X5C, including. Is there any intuition there that? So I is it worth it, going through the exercise? Yeah, I, I smaller. The, so an OCSP staple is is considerably smaller, um, and it's because it doesn't it doesn't contain the search chain, right? It really is just an object that is signed by the OCSP service, and you know. I mean, I, I, I did pull an example of an OCSP response, and I, I believe I even put it in. I just put it in and said it's, it's a mock-up, but it gives you a sense now, that, and that does not include our proprietary extension, so that would make it some bytes longer. And it was a big uh, signature size. It was 5 Yeah, it, it's not, yeah, it wasn't easy right. to say, yeah. So, like... And, and Chris Wan, again, um, we generally don't send the root also. Um, in that instance, yeah. yeah. But, but, but for no, X5C... You, never send the root. We're not going to send the root for no. X5C for no. for that. You never do that. Okay. Well, if people are cool, <laughs> no, no, I'm cool with that. So that, yeah. that 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 makes it smaller, but it's still just a question That's again. Fine. If you're doing like delegation, and we think the primary use case for this is delegation, if there is multi-layer delegation, like like that, right? That, that can, makes that makes this path longer, but you still the root you have to trust for. Right. Yes. Well, you should, you, in, in shaken-ish environments, you do. Yes. Okay. In so think environments, too. Yeah. I think that the means we can move on to the next slide. So, next presenter. <laughs> You're in Chechnya now. Chechnya. Chechnya. I don't know when I started that because I, I literally do just copy these from my previous things. So um, I do try to give it a different name in every one I where we are. That. Yes. Prague, yeah. And SF, <laughs> I had like San Francisco, Bay Area, and then like I, I forget, I had another one. But um, yes, yeah, so last time uh, we took an action item uh, to talk a bit about the interaction of STIR and message layer security. And uh, this message layer security stuff, it's very popular. I actually tried to attend the working group meeting the other day, and it was unlike this room, uh, standing room only, crammed in like sardines. A lot of people really into this MLS stuff these days. So uh, what, what we did on this, uh, Richard Barnes has been one of the protagonists in uh, the development of MLS. So I reached out to him. We had a conversation, a recall by the pool outside in um, SFO and talked about kind of what this integration might look like between STIR and MLS. And uh, Richard's guidance about this was effectively that we should define a new set of MLS credential types for this. And that is the approach that we actually put forward in this document. You can look at this as a bit of a sequel to the uh, recently, I mean, I know the RFC number, I just need to push some buttons on uh, Auth48, the recent uh, STIR for messaging, draft, which outlines a number of use cases that might utilize um, STIR for messaging, including uh, RCS. And it turns out that there's been some talk, including, I believe, since the past ITF, even some public statements about the integration of MLS into RCS. And that is a potentially very interesting interaction, because as we all know, RCS is largely set up with SIP transactions, and that would make this uh, a big win for us if we found a way to give MLS a story about how it could leverage credentials that attest uh, ownership of telephone network resources 
because it turns out there's still a lot of messaging out there in the world that uses telephone numbers as identifiers, right? And like, wouldn't it be great if there was a way that you could identify uh, group members in MLS uh, as, you know, by the telephone number that they are attaching through. So our zero zero draft, we specify two and a half approaches. Next slide. Uh, approach number one is just to create an MLS credential type for RFC 8226 certificates. Those are the certs I talked about earlier that have this TN auth list extension to them that allows you to specify either service provider codes or telephone numbers or telephone number ranges. MLS already has a credential type for X509. I have had some people come up to me this week and say, why aren't you just using that? Or why don't we like redefine MLS credential type zero to include a RFC 8226 certificates. Personally, I think 8226 certificates are different enough that I would probably keep these as separate credential types because it's not like you're going to get some standard X509 library that supports TN auth list and the things associated with it. Now, doing this with certs, there's kind of two sub approaches here, and that's why I call this two and a half approaches. There's kind of an approach and a half built into this first, um, first slide here. Because of course, these certs could have service provider codes, those operating company numbers that I mentioned earlier. And in that instance, interestingly, the cert doesn't really communicate anything about the identifier of an MLS group member. All it communicates is there's a carrier who is vouching for this person. And so you, in that instance, you would have to rely on the MLS application. The application is using MLS to actually convey what those identifiers are. And this is not an uncommon case. I mean, when you think about MLS, you know, it, the, the similarity of the name MLS to TLS is not accidental. It really is kind of a, a you know, middle layer, right, between the transport and the application that is there to provide this set of security features. And so you end up relying on the application to do a lot. Um, basically, when you use MLS anyway. Um, but it does mean that the assurance you're getting is not going to be superior to, you know, carrier A asserts, you know, that this user is legit. Which is, by the way, the way the entire U.S. Uh, carrier ecosystem does it right now for phone calls. Yeah, is that a bug or a feature, by the way? Um, mm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Why is it no one wants to no one want to comment about that on the microphone here at the it, ITF? It, it got stir implemented. It it got us <laughs> where we are today. It did, and we would not be here today without a wonderful compromise was brokered by Henning Schulter, and if I recall, in a food court outside. Uh, it's like across the street from the FCC, where we agreed that this was how we could actually get this at least off the ground in the U.S. Um, but there is an alternative, and the alternative is, of course, delegate certificates. Delegate certificates are um, children sub-instruments of those SPC certs that are specific to particular telephone numbers. And um, with delegate certs, of course, they do explicitly assert, this is the telephone number for which my certificate is valid. And you know, that is a very attractive security property uh, for MLS usages in particular. And you know, we wrote a spec that's called SIP Brandy and I, you know, a number of its perpetrators are present in, in this room, I believe, um, though Richard Barnes hopefully is online, maybe too early for him, him to be here. But, um, you know, th that was really trying to define an overall end to end architecture that would allow media security to be bootstrapped onto STIR assurances. This is a project we did. It is RFC 8862, I think, if anyone is interested. Um, but that is obviously the most secure mode overall for integration that we're going to propose among these two and a half approaches. But uh, at the same time, we didn't actually define that as a separate MLS credential type. The way the draft reads today, we could have chosen to do three. We instead just said there's a type that is for 8226 certificates. And then there is the second type I'm about to talk to in a moment. Any questions about this approach? Did people think it would be better? to break out um, this MLS credential type into one for SPC certs and one for delegate and individual TN certs? Anybody? I believe the syntax allows you to put both. Yeah. So that would, what would you do if you had one that had both? I got it. Yes. Yeah. My sense is that, that 
train them together is the, is the best approach. I mean, like why, like the, the, the you know, the, the whole concept of like the way MLS handles certificates, just like TLS is like, there's some stuff over here that has some keys at the end and you should do some things to make sure that you're satisfied that like this thing is cool. And so like, I think as long as like, as long as it fits, as long as it can be parsed with like your five nine parser, like it should go right here. That was my That's intuition cool. as well. I'll just say my name, Chris Went. Um, I just wonder if the whole, you know, especially in the context of Mimi and MLS, where you have maybe carrier participants and non-carrier participants, like that SPC really. So I would just treat, I, I don't think I'd split them. I think I'd treat them the same, but figure out as people start implementing it and think more about it, you know, whether that make whether SBC or TNs really makes sense. When you think about it, especially for those RCS ish cases that we're distantly envisioning, I imagine those would look like SPC certs, right? They would be the carriers doing this and you would get that assurance like from the overall ecosystem that yes, this particular carrier goes with it. So if I had to guess what the low hanging fruit deployment for it is, it's that. Though obviously for security reasons, I would much rather bring this down to an instrument that is much closer to the end user device. So that the security association for media is, um, you know, just as, as E2E as possible. Chris, please use the get in line thing. <laughs> it's, it's Friday, man. All, all protocol has broken down <laughs> in the ITF. It's just uh, much better for remote participants. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. I, I'm always actually clicking myself out of the queue when I'm about to talk. And then <laughs> like the chairs are like, oh, well, next person. Like, no, I was here. It's just I was as I was walking up, I was anyway. Uh, next, next slide, please. <laughs> All right. So we defined a second MLS credential type in this for passports. And so why did we do this? Um, we did this because passports are really good at making explicit who the member would be of an MLS group. We have a ton of tools in this. We have the Ridge, we have our CD. We could be providing names and we could be providing pictures and like doing all the stuff that whatever the application is using MLS would be able to consume and have like a strong security assurance for. And moreover, because we built into passports this uh, uh, claim that is called uh, M key, um, M key can actually carry a hash over a public key that is being used for MLS. Um, that seemed to provide a pretty solid binding. This is in fact the way that SIP Brandy works. We're just cribbing this from what we did for SIP Brandy. But you know, that comes to the caveat. And the caveat is, of course, if that passport is signed by an SPC cert, then um, that M key parameter, you know, you are trusting that the service provider who is signing for that is faithfully relaying it and not in fact some other key that would be used for um, an intermediary attack. Now, uh, MLS may have some ways out of band to be able to detect that. Ecker, you would probably understand that better than I do. Um, but like or, I, Barnes alluded to me anyway, that there was some way that that might be a detectable condition. Um, but like, I, that, you know, right now we just put that as a caveat that like basically you know, you're trusting the carrier here to be responsible for faithfully reporting the fingerprint of the key that appears in MKey. So I think first, maybe make sure I understand, isn't this the same situation as if you have an SPC cert? It is. Okay, great. Um, I mean, that's just the, I mean, so basically, I mean, the entire nature of like, of like Mimi security is effectively, you know, something, something, something attested to by the provider, <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, uh, so, um, you know, and in fact, that's the topic like is probably being discussed at this exact moment, um, uh, where there was a general consensus that um, you know that that there be you know some vaguely web PKI ish kind of story around this, um, which would we just like fit in this just fine, um, you know, whether it be attestations from people and you'd like to, and either you trust them or you not. In terms of like detecting lying, I mean, like key transparency, mumble, mumble, mumble. Um, nobody has like a really good story, but like, I mean, the bottom line is to the extent to which the, you know, is that 
I mean, I'm just telling you saying people think people already know, but there are only really two like available mechanisms for doing these kinds of authentications, right? One is that the people who own the namespace like make assertions about things below them. And the other is you have some third party which attempts to verify directly that like someone controls pieces of the namespace and then they make decisions about them. It's like the first is like my knowledge what store is and the second is like my knowledge what PTI is. And yeah. like in both cases, that person can just like lie like any time they want. Um, the store is actually probably a little better. It was more like DNSSEC that you can't just live at any number, but just the numbers have been sort of assigned. Um, so I, I, I don't, I mean, I think, you know, yeah, we don't want the carrier to lie, but like we have to find other ways to stop them from lying. Right, and so the only way we have to do that is delegate certs. Basically, it was the the sub approach on the previous slide that if in fact you know the cert is held by the end user device, effectively. Well, then but, but, can... what stops them from just issuing a new new delegate cert? Yeah, so the, yeah, agreed <laughs> that uh, the 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 carrier can choose to impersonate you. I mean, this is basically I mean, this is basically cert. delegate cert. What you're describing here is effectively delegate cert. It is a it is a new it credential is. signed in a non X509 format signed by the by, by a species a species certificate, right? I, I see what you mean. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, it is. I mean, I, I, I guess I hold up mo more hope for uh, key transition kind of things for like delegate certs. Well, but than I, I do if you're allowed to do it for X509, maybe yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I, yeah, I, I think these are like pretty similar. I'm not too like you know, okay. um, yeah. like if if like. Like we should be so lucky as having the problem that we have a key transparency, but we can't figure out how to make it work <laughs> with life's passports. Yes. yes. Um, uh, I, guess, I mean, uh, the one thing I will mention is that like um, you do need, in order for like any of these schemes to really work well, you need like a relatively like a long lived key, just because like otherwise the key KT log gets super clogged. So yeah. like um, you know, so what will not work like good is um, if the um, is if the uh, uh, the the, the like the, every new operation by like by the client has because a new key is assigned by like the sign a new, a new password that will like not work well, right? Yeah. But call for with KT. Yeah. So it doesn't play well with short lived. Yeah. Well, as long as the keys are, are, are as long as the keys are consistent, I think it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, like, does anybody oh, yeah. know what so, KT really consists of? Yeah. No, but like, yes. like I think one, I, I think I think it's like widely understood that if you had like. Very short lived expiry, you could find some way to make it work as long as you like, as long as the, key, the transparency is around the key material, not around the certificate. I think the key point out of that is passports are generally a call time decision versus if you want a future of key transparency and a priori doing all the right things, you know, vetting your customer, like all those things and creating the certificate that represents that, like, I think that's the future that I think is obvious that would be better. Yes. Um, I, it's the future I, that I, you and I want. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. And uh, just, there is one small bullet at the end there about expiry, um, that that needs to be handled carefully. It's, of course, message sessions can be long lived. Our expectations for passports is usually they live for about a minute. And so, you know, that might be an issue that we need to address in implementations and how that how that applies to like group messages and all these cases in in MLS where somebody is joining a group or there's been a big history of messages and that you know just you know that that could really make our heads explode but the purpose of this zero zero draft was not to try to solve those problems but instead to say here are some broad approaches right that we think are salient uh, next slide you know, I, I don't think we're now in a position to choose between these. And honestly, I, I don't think we necessarily will end up in a position where we're going to recommend only one of these two and a half approaches. I think they may turn out to have uh, applicability to different using applications of MLS or to different situations. But uh, what I'm here to ask, of course, since there is so much interest from Mimi and so on in this, is if people think overall this is a good direction, especially the direction of our approach here is just to specify the MLS credential types, right? And to say like, that's, that, that's the core thing that we're doing with this. We'll then go expand and talk about some further applications and use cases. But, um, and of course we should coordinate at some point with MLS about this. I did not get up and give a spiel there yet. But um, if people think this is a good idea, should we push forward with it? What do people think? People like this, I see a one thumb up uh, is there a Roper? Okay, we got Ebert and Roper, at least two thumbs up. Okay, we got three thumbs up. There's four thumbs up, five thumbs up. Look at that. All right. Just widespread agreement is what I would call that in this room. Do, does anyone 
want to do thumbs down. <laughs> um, uh, so one thing I just wanted to sort of um, uh, uh, flag here is that, as I understand the situation, there, um, uh, there's, you know, the issue of like device change, for instance, under yes. the same identifier. So um, obviously MLS has a mechanism for handling that, but just like I don't understand, I don't understand enough about like how, like you know, any of the stuff works in telephony. But like, if there's like a lot of key churn, like that mouth, you don't. You don't I mean, way. This was entirely what we we're just talking about, like in the previous presentation, right? About OCSP and short-lived certs and all that. That that is our way, but of addressing key churn. Yeah, yeah. Um, that I mean, that's all we got. No, I, I agreed. It, uh, I, um, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. Just trying to think through a little bit, like, um, in uh. You might me you want to talk separate labs. Okay. I think I think I, are there cases are there situations where where the telephony model of like phone number assignment does not match well with like the MLS model of like you know um uh, uh, of like identity um and where like you might get into trouble. But I don't think of it. I'm not sure I have any. But I just I think I, can. I I'm super worried about the historical cases. But I'm joining a message group that's been going on for like nine months, and like this person's key was valid for that telephone number like eight months ago. And like, you know, so what, what is that? That's going to place a burden yeah. on implementations to keep historical records of what the state of those keys were. And it's okay. It's okay. That keys expired now, but as long as eight months ago, I mean, yeah. I fear that's where we're going with this. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, we should, I think this, we should definitely adopt this so we can find out those, those topics. Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. this is a good, good approach. Yeah. I love that topic. Um, but I, I think we should think about it as just purely an application level authentication scheme, right? Like device is, uh, is something that, you know, is, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Temporarily association, you know, it's a temporary association. It's not a like embedded in the device association. Um, I don't know. I, I think we sometimes think of telephony and messaging as, as something that isn't as, those are both application level constructs, not, you know, embedded in the SIM card or something like that. Um, yep. So abstracting that I think is a good thing. So I think the, the issue there is if you join a chat room, you know, and then nine months from now you've, ported your number, you've uh, done all kinds of things that would have changed the credential that you would have used. And then you make some, you know, uh, murderous threat or something in the chat room. Law enforcement wants to know who you are. <laughs> right. But that, but that where John said, that's why yeah, we're, exactly. that's we're, where we're the talking about sta comes. stapling yeah, or yeah. short-lived search. I mean, I'm honestly, the case I'm even more worried about that is one where I made a murderous threat you know, eight, eight months ago. And I'm sorry this got into murderous threat. That's the same, <laughs> not me. Um, you know, it, but you, you want to be able to prove, right, that I was the one who made that murderous yes. threat and my key has stopped since. And law enforcement joins this group, you know, at the not nine month later threshold and needs to be able to go back and say, this comment eight months ago was that actually authentically made by this person. And I mean, it, it's that record keeping. Um, that seems like it's nasty. Especially when you sell your device to an innocent person. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, now we're getting into like probably a little territory. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, like, don't they do this now? Like with no signatures at all. And like, they just like have records of like where the name came from. So, you know, um, I mean, this is something we talked about a lot in MLS too. It's like, you know, like, like a lot of person doesn't have a problem like attributing like misbehavior, even in the absence of like non-repudiation. People may not be able to say I'm air quoting non-repudiation. <laughs> um, um, so you know, I, I mean, I think like I'm much more concerned about that. I'm much more concerned about the situation where like you know where people say where we give people information not to like continuously validate their credentials, and then as you, as you as you point out, like you say, well, it was good like tw two weeks ago, and then a new guy comes in, and now I can't validate it. Um, um, I guess. I'm trying to, I, I have to go look at 9420 says, does 9420 say, like, you know, you should have continuous validation. And if so, like, they're not going to play well with anything that's got a super short lifetime, obviously. Um, but then we may need, we may just, you know, like update 9420. Um, I, my, my vague, vague memory is to actually left off the application. So, like, maybe we'll be okay. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. 
I, I, that was, are there anybody who has thumbs down on uh, doing it or not? Yes. All right, cool. So I think we have an action item to do a call for adoption on the list. Right? That's what I heard. That would be great. But we'll do the other one. We'll do the other one first. Yes, it'd be great if we did short lived. Yes, yeah. and got that because there are there are people who seem to really like that as an approach. So I think that's the end. I think I think we've got nothing left. You can go get some. I, I'm going to go get coffee. I I did not get before this meeting. Um, but thanks so much for coming. Uh, as always, in the last day, our area director is here. Our Murray. Area director is here. Murray. He showed up. <laughs> yeah, someone's in the oh. queue. Oh, I saw at the end there was sort of like other business. And, yes. There is. Um, so I don't know if we're getting to that part. That's we are getting to that part. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so my name's Kalia, and my handle online is Identity Woman, and I'm. I've lead a conference called the internet identity workshop and have done so for 18 years and many you know, OAuth and other identity work has been happening here for a while but more identity things are showing up and i'm kind of i'm trying to understand I, i've learned the phone people are into identity too <laughs> and i'm just trying to understand um how like is there an opportunity for mutual learning and connection between some of the work around verifiable credentials and other things that seem similar but slightly different and how um you know how can this work align with that work and vice versa not immediately but at least can we have more dialogue between these two worlds that are i think trying to solve quite similar problems there are some similar problems, I believe, but there's also a, a little more rigid um, process for getting a phone number. And that's what we hit. What this is about is where the identity is the phone number, not who has been assigned that phone number. Think about that. It twists it a little. RCS. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, then was. So, RCS yes. It yes, does. and like I know yes. folks in the phone world who are trying to figure out how to communicate who is behind the phone number yep. to the end party and how, you know, there's challenges with particularly phone numbers that belong to um, entities, not natural mm -hmm. persons, that those are getting flagged as spam and like causing challenges and you don't want the VA's number to be labeled as spam because you want the veterans to get the call from their healthcare providers, but they are like, anyway, so. We're, that's why I said there's room for dialogue. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody sort of ended up saying what I was gonna say, like, yes, I think there's an opportunity. Yes, there is a huge conversation about who is behind that telephone number um, both for positive use cases of truly identifying who, who's calling you so that you know who, who or messaging you so that you actually know who that is, but also from a, you know, from an enforcement point of view that if right. you're doing bad things that, that, you know, that somebody, and, and that is especially true with enterprise and spoofed use cases. Um, but the, on the, on the people side, there's also issues of, you know, identifying yourself, but also maybe staying anonymous for certain certain use cases. So we need to be careful of those use cases. But um, but yes, I, I, my answer to your original question is a definite yes. And kind of speaking, that's weird. Okay, kind of speaking as a chair, uh, when we talk about cross pollination or possibly cross contamination between groups, generally the IETF has found that the most effective thing is cross participation. Uh, so, you know, if you could send something to our list that maybe says how one would participate in this, um, or you know what it takes to participate in it, whatever that is, and then we would also invite participants there to come here. Um, sometimes, you know, we do formal liaisons, but. but that I don't think that's generally as effective as cross participation. I don't know if the AD wants to say anything about that. 
<laughs> Murray declines. Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say, I mean, since we are like going to uh, break and go get coffee, uh, I'd be happy, I'm sure Chris and I both would, to sit down with you for 15 and kind of give you a sense of what we think this does and doesn't do. And um, since there seems to be nothing else in the schedule. But, but, could, but can, I, can I ask Murray, can we like not meet on Friday next time? Yes, you can. My recollection of being on the ISG is that you have some small influence over these matters, and so I, I'll remind you um, in advance of Brisbane. I will say, I think we had better participation when we were on a weekday, a non Friday last time. Yeah, but this is two in a row Friday. <laughs> okay. We weren't Friday last time. Yeah, we were. We were. Okay. Okay. We're, we're set then? We're good? Yes. We Thank are you. Adjourned. Thank you, chairs. Thank you, ADs. Thank you, everyone. John. Yeah. Is there a, a GSMA group that's explicitly working on MLS for RCS? I was actually just looking at this. Yeah. So I don't message. Google. But they don't just have one group working Google on this. Doing this like, so they'll bring it fully formed, fully formed out of Google's forehead to, yes. Okay. We almost need some designator when we're talking about MLS, the Google, it'll be, let me see. It'll be RCS based. Yeah, that was, well, this is literally just taking RCS and saying, instead of MSRP or TLS or whatever, we yeah. do MLS. Okay. I mean, but this is Google's over the top RCS, not the carrier RCS. Oh, those are very different. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You did all the work this time. I did? Oh, right. Pre work. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that. Yeah. Uh, so we, agreed, I... we agreed to public something on the, in here. Can you shepherd that one? Because I'm still working on shepherding the last one. Yes. Okay. In fact, I thought I said that. So okay. I said, I guess that means this one's mine. <laughs> okay. Maybe I didn't uh, connect in my head what that meant. Yeah, it means I'll do the shepherd right. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay. Your first idea. Uh, yes, and sort of. So it has been around a while. John and Chris Went, who spoke at the microphone a few times, have done most of the documents. And we, we wish it wasn't that way. We wish you had more spread out editors, but that's just the way it's worked out. They're the ones who put their hands up. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we have typically met on Fridays, and we typically haven't had, had a lot of participants. There's more participants on our mailing list. Uh, the group is kind of on and off again, busy. So we'll go a long time without a lot of stuff, and then, and then we'll have a flurry of work. Uh, and the group is different than most ITF groups is that the people that are implementing what we're doing are primarily another standards body that is taking what we do and incorporating into their standards. That's the, uh, for the U.S., that's a, the group called ATIS, A-T-I-S. They have a, a task force called IPNNI for uh, Internet Protocol Network to Network Interface. And they are the formal authority about how the U.S. telephone carriers you do tel telephone number authentication. And they use what we produce. So it's kind of strange that they're our primary customer. It's not like, and then vendors go out and write code based on what they say that they're selling to the U.S. carriers. Now, different countries may have their own groups doing this, and but that's where we were incorporated first, or where we were used first. Uh, so that may change, and hopefully in the near future. 
but that's very different than most IETF groups where you have a larger number of, of companies and, and uh, developers that are developing to the standards as they go. Uh, Addis doesn't really like to incorporate work until they think it's pretty stable. So we don't have a lot of uh, development in parallel to the work we're doing like some other groups do. Sorry? Oh. Okay. I don't know how to turn this mic. Test, test. No, it's still on. Okay, everything we say is being transcribed on the mic. So let me move it somewhere else. Yeah. So, may eventually I know that France is looking at some of the Belgium, the UK is definitely not quite European, but so it's kind of a schedule of information. So in the US, the FCC is mandated to use the Schengen is the framework that Adam talks about. They call it search for Schengen. FCC is mandated to the US. In Canada, following pretty much the Canada's communication story, is following very much what the US And then various communications are looking at this. And the GSMA in particular is uh, uh, looking at any number of uh, what they call uh, uh, calling party ID, uh, trusted trust calling party ID between the carriers. Uh, and, and, and they're looking at star shaking, and they're looking at other experts. And it's real very much in the we're writing uh, so, well, what happened, reports on what's available and not, not a lot of publication. A specific yeah. caller ID is the primary purpose. Now, obviously, we're branching out to the public uh, issue. And then lately, we have uh, um, a draft that is about to be published any day now. Called Rich Callback. There was added an additional identification. So before it was just we authenticated the caller ID. And now we're talking about authenticating potentially the caller ID. Uh, maybe a long go and maybe a call purpose. They could all you know, show up on a handset and be authenticated. And then we talked today about another possibility of authenticating the call, which I think is going to be explosively important very soon, but no one's actually figured out they need it yet. <laughs> Both models are working. Right. In, the, so in the U.S., you have to see huge worry about that because they get the most points. They get a huge number of points. You know, it's a matter of whether you want to hire staff, staff to do it or you want to pay all of the uh, issues. But it's a big window, which is a stop scoop there. And it also means that we have a way to trace back the caller. Uh, so if you have a part of the caller, it's easy to find the perpetrator. Although the way of doing it in the US, you don't know, actually find the perpetrator, you find the uh, originating service provider who hopefully knows who the perpetrator is. Okay. I hope you uh, can continue to join. I hope you can continue to join. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then there's a difference between identifiers and identifiers that are network resolvable endpoints. And then after you which is sort of where we see that's a good idea. Yeah, so Thank you. 